Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another lecture, our last one of this week. We've got one more full week and a single day left after that, so things are moving along quickly. Today, we are looking at a second piece by Thomas Nagel. So we already looked at one piece by Nagel on death, uh, back when we were looking at death and immortality. Now we're looking at this piece from Nagel called The Absurd, uh, which is really a, a piece he wrote on uh, being life and, and absurdity in which he responds to Camus. So um, I've already talked a little bit about who Nagel is, so I'll just leave it at that. We'll dive right into the actual material. So what does Nagel do here? Well, he agrees with Camus in some ways, but he disagrees in others. So we're going to see that Nagel agrees with Camus that life is absurd, or, or certainly can be absurd, uh, but he provides a different account of how that comes about. So we're going to see that he disagrees with Camus about why our lives are absurd, though he agrees that they are absurd. Nagel uh, compares the absurd and our ability to see our lives as absurd with philosophical skepticism. So we'll hear a little bit about that, about how he thinks those cases are similar. Like philosophical skepticism, Nagel argues that the absurd is really inescapable or it's potentially escapable, but probably not for creatures like us, uh, certainly not the way we, we would usually go about trying to escape things. Uh, and lastly, Nagel concludes that Camus' response to the absurd is really incorrect and that the correct response is irony. So instead of revolt, uh, revolting against our absurdity, instead we should really accept it with a kind of irony. So let's go ahead and jump in and see what Nagel has to tell us. So Nagel basically agrees with Camus' definition of absurdity, uh, though <clears throat> Camus arguably doesn't ever sort of sit down and, and quite define it, but he certainly characterizes it for us. So this is Nagel. He tells us that in ordinary life, a situation is absurd when it includes a conspicuous discrepancy between pretension or aspiration and reality. Uh, and he gives some funny examples about this. You know, you, you get knighted and your pants fall down, or, um, you know, you give a big complicated speech in favor of a um, motion that's already passed. Maybe I'm a little more centered. I think that made it worse. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, make myself, oh, and that's even double worse. Maybe, yeah, that's, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. There, that's. Close enough, you're probably not here to really see me anyway. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, 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 absurdity or the absurd really comes about when there's this um, dichotomy or, or discrepancy. There's some kind of gap between the, the pretension we have for things and what it's really like. Um, you know, another one might be that we, we say spend a lot of time producing a piece of art and we think it's brilliant. Uh, and then when we sort of show it to other people or, or it gets displayed, um, other people maybe think it's you know, the work of a child or something, right? It's, it's like, oh, like, did your, your five-year-old make this painting? It's like, no, I spent a whole week making it myself. But it's, it's my life's work. This would be, in some sense, absurd, of course. Fairly sad as well. Um, but the absurd need not necessarily be sad, but it really comes from this discrepancy. So with this definition in mind. Nagel considers some of the usual metaphors for the absurd, um, things like, you know, in a million years nothing's going to matter, or just little specks in the vastness of space and time. You know, some of the things that I brought up right near the start of the course is ways of trying to motivate uh, this, this question of, you know, what's the meaning of life, or, you know, what's, why are we here, what's our purpose, and so on. But Nagel thinks that these metaphors really don't do the work required of them. Um, so upon analysis, he thinks, you know, they, they seem to capture some kind of feeling that we have, uh, but on their own, they don't really point to any serious problem. So for instance, on um, the point that nothing will matter in a million years, uh, you know, nothing now will matter in a million years, Nagel says, well, that's sure, you know, that could be true, uh, but by the same token, if that's true, then um, right now, it doesn't matter what's going to happen in a million years, right? Now, what matters now matters now. What happens in a million years happens in a million years. Uh, and just noting the fact that 
th those are different time frames and things are going to matter at different times itself doesn't tell us that nothing matters right now <clears throat> unless what we're trying to get at is that nothing right now matters period uh, which is is really a different point and if we're trying to make that point by saying well nothing now will matter in a million years uh, Nagel also counters that he says well how can you be sure right uh, if you don't know what matters period full stop just actually matters uh, not indexed to some particular time then you can't say with any certainty that nothing that happens now is going to matter in a million years right? um, you know we could just narrowing it down a little bit uh, for most of us our existence isn't going to matter much within a very short time frame so i'm fairly confident that not very long <clears throat> not very long after my death uh, my life probably won't matter too much at least not to many people um, certainly within 100 years i expect to be sort of pleasantly forgotten there are other people that don't fit that bill right we can look back through history to religious prophets or powerful people very influential people uh, and their lives continue to matter, at least in some sense, hundreds if not thousands of years after their death. Uh, the fact that we're mere specks in the vastness of space and time, Nagel says, this, this metaphor doesn't really give us any concrete point either. He, he says, you know, well, let's, let's just imagine the differences. So we're these tiny little specks in this vastness of, of the universe and how long it is and everything. He says, but would our situation be any more meaningful or less absurd if the universe was smaller, right? If the whole universe was just like the earth and, and the moon and the sun or something, would that somehow make our lives more meaningful? He says, it doesn't seem like it. What if we were just larger? The universe was as big as it was, but we were the size of galaxies or something. It, it doesn't seem to make any difference there either. So he says, these metaphors, while they, they point to something and they seem revealing in some sense, they don't really make a concrete case. They don't really make an argument. Right? They don't really give us reason to think that our lives are absurd or, or meaningless or anything like that. So, looking at Camus' approach a little bit more specifically, because of course these, these metaphors are, are sort of generic ones, they're very easy ones to throw about, we're talking about things like the meaning of life. Nagel looks more particularly at Camus' writing and uh, ultimately thinks Camus is wrong about how the absurd arises, about what the source of it is. So as we saw yesterday, Camus thinks that the absurd arises from this discrepancy between what we want from the world and what it gives us. So we have this demand for meaning or this demand for unity, as he puts it, or you know, some kind of integration, some kind of connection with the world around us. Uh, but the world around us is really indifferent to us and our projects and our values and, and what we seem to care about. Um, it's, it's in some sense alien. It's, it's very different to us, uh, inhuman, as Camus puts it. Now, because Camus puts it this way, Nagel says, what this seems to leave the door open to is the possibility that in a, a differently constituted universe, the absurd wouldn't arise. That if somehow the universe did care about us or our projects or had values built right into it or, or something like this, then it would be possible for the absurd to be just extinguished and, and eliminated. But Nagel thinks that's wrong. Instead of seeing the absurd arising from this collision between ourselves and this indifferent universe around us, instead, Nagel thinks it arises um, from a collision within ourselves. So it's not about the world not living up to our expectations, not being what we want it to be. Rather, it's a feature of us. And really, no matter the situation we find ourselves in, no matter what kind of universe or world we, we find ourselves in, Nagel thinks the absurd can always arise precisely because it's a product of some of our characteristics. Now, there are many specific instances of absurdity, and, and Nagel you know, points to some of these with the pants falling down at the nighting and so on. But he says, you know, if we're looking for a philosophical sense of absurdity, this has to be something that arises from some universally shared situation or characteristics. He says, this condition is supplied by the collision between the seriousness with which we take our lives and the perpetual possibility of regarding everything about which we are serious as arbitrary or open to doubt. So that's really the condition that uh, allows for the absurd to arise for all of us. It's this 
collision within ourselves between the seriousness with which we take our lives on the one hand, and on the other hand, the fact that we can look at anything we do, any of our projects, plans, our, our entire life as something that is in some sense arbitrary or um, ultimately unjustified somehow, uh, yet we continue to take our lives seriously. So even though we can't fully justify what we're doing, even though we, we can't get a full account of why it makes sense, uh, we keep on doing it. That's where the absurd seems to arise. Really, what's, what's the, the discrepancy or, or the, the issue then? You know, what's, what's there the gap between? For Camus, it's our expectations in the world. For Nagel, it's uh, the seriousness with which we, we take ourselves and our lives and the fact that we can't fully justify that seriousness to ourselves. Right? So it's, it's this purely internal thing, right? It's, it's about us and about how we engage with things and how we look at things um, and think about them. So Nagel says, you know, on, um, oh, I'll, I'll put this up here. So we've got these, these two points. I'm sorry, I was just <laughs> getting ahead of myself. Um, so we take our lives seriously. You know, we all have projects, plans of some sort. Um, he characterized different things. You know, we care about our appearance and, and what we're doing and how the people like us and, and where we're headed and if we did the right things in the past, if we make the right decisions for the future, so on and so forth. You know, we're, we're not like animals. And so there's a point here that Nagel shares with Camus. We're not like other creatures, at least so far as we can tell. Uh, other creatures that act more on instinct than we do, and, and even if they do think in the right sorts of terms, um, planned to some degree and so on, it doesn't seem like they have the cognitive ability we do to engage in the second part, this backward step, to really go beyond the present, go beyond our, our projects, call them into question, ask for justifications, think about alternative possibilities, and so on. Now, like Camus, um, Nagel thinks that in some sense, if we were more like animals, if we were able to take this backward step and in some sense transcend our situation, reflect on ourselves, um, ask for justifications, engage in reasoning in the way we do, then the absurd likely wouldn't arise. Now, um, Nagel makes the point that when we take this backward step, when we step outside of ourselves and, and almost look upon ourselves and our projects and our attitudes and feelings the way we might look at someone else so we can look at ourselves from the outside so to speak. Uh, he says it shouldn't be mistaken that when we take that backward step somehow we get the objectively correct picture of things it's not like we we step back and see what really matters or what's really valuable or or what we should really do and then realize that we're somehow mistaken Rather, when we take that backward step and step outside of our usual valuing and, and projects and planning and our seriousness and so on, what we see there is really, uh, in, in some sense, a view from nowhere. And from that position, we really aren't able to, to ultimately justify our lives and, and our projects and what we take seriously at all. So it's not that we come to see what really matters, it's that when we take that backward step, at least when we take it to a, a certain degree, we cease to see how anything really matters, right? We, we ultimately start running out of the ability to uh, justify ourselves. So Nagel talks a little bit, he says, you know, one way to try to justify one's life or find meaning in it is to align oneself with a project larger than oneself. So, uh, you know, a social movement or country or whatever it might be, right? You know, we can think about um, all sorts of narratives of, of giving one's life for one's country, committing oneself to patriotic acts or uh, religious movements or social movements or committing oneself to great art or whatever it might be. Um, we can get ourselves tied up in these sorts of projects. But, Nagel says, we can always continue the, the step from there and say, yeah, but what is the, makes those projects? worthwhile or justified or what have you. And even though we can, we can give answers to some degree, we can always keep asking the questions. And so eventually, we just run out of reasons. Right? Uh, we're always able to ask further questions, but we're not always able to give further reasons. 
So at some point, the reasoning gives out. The answers give out, even though the questions are still there. So as long as our lives contain both of these elements, as long as we take them seriously, and as long as we're able to take this backward step, calling into question any set of reasons, any kind of justification we give for what we're doing and why, why we're doing it, then our situation can always seem absurd. All right, seem absurd or be absurd. I'm just gonna draw attention to that distinction. This is something else that came up a little bit in Camus as well. I think there's an interesting question here about um, what we're talking about. Are we talking about our lives actually being absurd or are we talking about our feeling that they're absurd at least some of the time? I'm just gonna let that dangle. That's something to think about. So this is where we can come around to this um, comparison Nagel makes with philosophical skepticism. So in philosophy, fairly well-known uh, issue, and this comes out in a lot of um, popular literature and, and uh, popular sort of mediums, you know, film, movie, television, books, comics, you name it. Um, the, the issue of skepticism, how do we really know anything? Um, how do we know the world is the way it seems to us? So, for instance, you know, Nagel talks about the sort of global skepticism issue a little bit. Um, look, right now, I think I'm talking. I think I'm sitting on my desk and I'm sitting in my office and so on and so forth. But of course, all that depends on the sensory information I'm getting right now being correct. Right? So when I look around, I see books and I see this and right, the camera and everything, and I see my notes. Um, that my senses are reporting accurately somehow. But of course it's possible I could be dreaming right now or hallucinating or what have you. Right? Now, if I were dreaming right now, I'd still be getting the sensory information, but probably, um, or at least quite possibly, nothing within the dream would tell me that it's a dream. Right? It's only once I wake up from the dream, I realize it was a dream. So there's no way for me to really be sure that I'm not in a dream right now. And if I can't be sure I'm not in a dream, I can't really be sure that I'm here recording this video. So how do I really know that I'm making the video or, or anything, right? And we can do this with any piece of, of putative knowledge. Anything we think we know, we can always ask, okay, well, how, how are you sure you know, right? What about these sorts of objections? What about these defeaters? Defeaters are uh, really reasons that if, if offered and were true, would defeat the claim of knowledge you have. So right now I claim to be sitting here recording a lecture for you. Um, a defeater for that would be I'm actually lying in bed dreaming that I'm doing this, right? If that fact is actually true, then I'm not really here recording a lecture. Do I, I have any good reason to show that that defeater is not true right now? No, right? In fact, there's all sorts of potential defeaters for any sort of potential knowledge claim. And Nagel says, you know, philosophical skepticism is, is really, it's this approach where we take any sort of claim to knowledge, any claim for something, and then we just keep asking questions, right? Well, how could we be sure about this or that or that or that or that? Uh, and eventually the justifications will run out. And then whatever the, the argument or position is, is rejected as ultimately being unjustified or unfounded. Uh, and, and so there's a whole dispute within philosophy about whether or not skepticism is a real issue or not, whether or not it can be solved or stopped. Uh, Nagel himself just sticks in a footnote there that he, he knows that people, you know, this is from right, 1970s, I think he's writing this, I think it was 73 this one came out. Um, he says, yeah, I, I know a lot of people say philosophical skepticism has in some sense been solved or refuted, uh, but he's not so sure. He's, he's been convinced by somebody that in fact, it still poses an issue. Uh, and I, I agree with Nagel there that it poses an issue if you take it seriously in the first place. But we can set aside that conversation for some other day, uh, perhaps a different course. Okay, so that's philosophical skepticism in a nutshell, right? Uh, we can't ever really be sure about any claim to knowledge. Um, and the, the whole way that happens is that we take any claim to knowledge and then we provide reasons how, why it can be called into doubt and then ultimately reject the claim as being unjustified because we can't solve all the doubts. Nagel says it's really the same with the absurd. 
uh, we lack proof, we lack justification that our lives are meaningful or worth the effort, that our, the projects we take seriously are really worth taking seriously. Um, so we lack that, that set of reasons or, or the you know, full justification for what we're doing, but we just keep doing it. He says, this is really uh, the same with, with skepticism. Even though we can't provide a full set of reasons or fully justify what we believe, we just go on believing it. So for instance, I don't, you know, I can't definitively refute the possibility I'm really in a dream and I'm not here to talk to you, yet I still believe it. So um, the way Nagel puts this with the absurd, he says the main condition of absurdity is the dragooning of an unconvinced transcendent consciousness into the servant service of an imminent limited enterprise like a human life. What, what does that mean? Well, dragooning, uh, that word, uh, dragoons were a, a particular kind of um, military unit used in the Napoleonic Wars, you, know, you can think of like 17th, 19th century. Um, dragoons were uh, typically soldiers that were, were billeted or housed in civilian housing. Uh, so they're kind of, uh, and, and the civilians really didn't get choice in this. So dragooning as a word is really a kind of forcing. Um, so just sort of translating what Nagel's saying, the main condition of absurdity is the forcing of an unconvinced um, consciousness that can, can transcend or go beyond our limits into the service of our, our limited, you know, temporal, um, not fully justified life, right? So we can do almost anything in our thought. We can think about all sorts of things. We can think about the universe around us and ask all sorts of questions and reason about all sorts of stuff. Yet when it comes to our actual lives, uh, we, we have to sort of, um, you know, pull, pull our thinking down from the heavens and apply it to often, uh, you know, very limited sort of aims, you know, like figuring out, oh, which, which car should I buy or, or whatever, right? Um, which place should I live? What course should I take? Right. And of course, in thought, you can go to like, well, why buy a car at all? Why take a degree? Why take courses? Why should I even go to school? Right. We, we can ask all these, these questions. Uh, if skepticism is a real uh, threat or, or possibility, then of course we can always say that um, there's no fully justified case that we can ever give for any of those things. So our consciousness is sort of forced to make a bunch of decisions, but it can't actually um, make a case to justify for itself why it's making those decisions in the first place. So what this all points to is that Really, at the heart of the issue, it seems like reasons give out. This, I, I think, ultimately, this is, is Nagel's point. Right? Uh, we can always keep asking questions, and eventually, we're just not going to have answers for them. Right? We just can't give reasons to them. Now, this only happens, right? This, this is only a possibility because of our intellectual capacity. Right? It's only because of our intelligence that we're able to keep asking questions uh, and that will ultimately have questions that outstrip the sorts of reasons we can give. But, Nagel thinks, demanding reasons ad infinitum or, or you know, to infinity, always asking more, always asking why, 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 that itself is really unjustified, right? or, or at least unnecessary. Our chains of justification can stop, Nagel thinks, unproblematically. Right. So he gives uh, the example, which I'm, I'm fairly certain referred somewhere else in this course already. Um, I think it was Wolf in uh, the, the afterlife stuff with Scheffler. Um, you know, look, if we've got a headache, we'll take a painkiller. And of course, we could say, well, why should I take steps to alleviate uh, my head pain? Right. Uh, and we could say something like, well, because it's not very, it's not nice to be in pain. And, and if we can take steps to be not in pain, um, all other things being equal, we should do it. All right. And then we can, well, okay, but, but why follow that principle? Why believe that, right? Um, we could sit and, and if we are willing to always question and, and say, yeah, but we always have to be able to justify any reason given with another reason, with another reason, with another reason, right? If we're willing to have that chain of, of justification go to infinity, then nothing's ever really justified because we've never gone through the whole chain of justification. So Nagel says, it is perfectly fine for chains of justification to come to a stop somewhere, 
right? And of course, we could always call into question the place that it stops, but it's not always justified to actually call out into question. It's something we can do, but it's not always something we should or need to do. Right? Sometimes it's fine to just make a decision. It's fine to believe something or act in a certain kind of way without um, requiring that further reason or that further justification, even though we're able to ask for it. So this brings Nagel around to this, this question. Can we escape the absurd? Can we just sort of get out of it? Um, can we, can we push it away? Can we close that door? Ultimately, Nagel says no, right? Why not? Well, um, again, it, it comes back to those two points from an earlier slide. What does the absurd arise from? From the seriousness with which we take our lives and that backward step from which we can sort of step back and look at ourselves, you know, from the inside, so to speak. Look at the seriousness with which we take our lives and our projects and continue to call them into question and ultimately run out of, of good answers, right? So if we're conscious of the absurd, right, which uh, I'd, I'd say probably, maybe not, uh, at least at this point, you know, now that we've come this far through the course, even if you weren't familiar with this idea or it hadn't really struck you before, uh, I think by now, especially going through Camus and Nagel and, and you know, some of the other authors who have been in some sense pointing us in this direction, you're at least aware of it, right? So if we're aware of the absurd, if we're conscious of it, we can't just will away that awareness. We can't just sort of choose to not recognize that anymore, right? Um, why? Because to try to consciously um, ignore something or will away the awareness, you have to be aware of what you're trying to avoid, right? So if you're, if you're trying to not look at something, for instance, right? Say I look at the shelf behind me and I'm trying not to look at the, the green books in here. Well, I have to know that the green books there are there to not look at them. But the whole point with the absurd is that it's not even just a thing we look at, rather, it's just something we're aware of. So as soon as we're aware of it, if you're trying to not be aware of it, to intentionally avoid being aware of it, you have to be aware of what you're trying to avoid. So it seems like it's this, this circular issue, right? To try to intentionally avoid being aware of it, you have to be aware of it. So that's not going to work. So there's another way we could try to avoid absurdity, which is really by trying to escape the seriousness with which we take our lives, right? Um, trying to uh, sort of free ourselves from those serious projects and attachments, become in some sense more animal-like. That would be the way I, I put it. Nagel doesn't quite put it this way. Uh, he says this you know, seems to be the aim of, of at least some Eastern religions. I think here we could point to probably Buddhism, uh, Taoism, to some extent. Uh, in both of those, part of what we see is uh, a move to not take things so seriously. And so we can think back to the Gallons reading, uh, where, where he's, of course, talking about um, Buddhism, and then he's talking about the, you know, the, the Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Uh, and as he puts it in there, um, you know, Part of, of what Buddhism is really going for is this sort of, of middle ground between enjoying your life and, and sort of sensual delights and, and enjoying things as they come uh, and not getting too attached to things, including different sorts of, of sensual pleasures and so on. So um, in, in some sense, Gallon was already, uh, Gallons was already dealing with this issue Nagel's identifying here that you know, if your project is to not have projects, in some sense, you're, you're going to fail. So if your project is to not take things too seriously, if you take that project itself too seriously, then you're going to fail. So you have to be able to approach things in a way that um, you're, you're not as committed to them. But of course, you can't even be too committed to not having too many commitments. Uh, there's there's a, the possibility here of, of sort of a self-defeating enterprise. Um, now, Nagel says that this kind of prospect seems unlikely for most people. It's not necessarily impossible. Um, he says that certainly seems like there is room here for some lines to be less absurd than others, precisely because they have fewer projects, serious projects, or the commitment to the projects is less serious. So when we take that backward step and we realize that the seriousness of our, our projects is really unjustified, there's less unjustified content in the life. So it's less absurd. But Nagel says, that doesn't mean it's any more meaningful. So here's one other interesting thing I've been 
trying to, to point us towards, you know, what are these thinkers or, or writers uh, assuming in what they're telling us? Well, for Nagel, it seems like, um, you know, the, the absurdity that, that characterizes our lives, the possibility of, a, of the absurd feeling always arising, um, this can, can sort of, there can be more or less of this absurdity in life, depending on how seriously we take our lives. But ultimately, um, no lives seem ultimately meaningful, right? And I don't think he necessarily, and feel free to disagree with me on this, necessarily uh, gives a full characterization of what a meaningful life would be and what is it exactly that makes it, uh, makes our lives not meaningful. I think, think, I'll at least sort of hypothesize here, that for Nagel, it's the fact that all of our lives are absurd, at least potentially absurd, uh, that means they aren't meaningful. But I'm, I'm not sure because then, uh, if that's the case, then it seems like non-human animals have meaningful lives, but I don't think Nagel's really committed to that either. So perhaps for Nagel, again, meaning is, um, meaning would, would require some kind of project, uh, ultimate project or purpose or something like that, but I don't think he's quite clear in that. Um, now, that could be taken as a criticism of Nagel's view, but he himself doesn't tell us in this piece that he's setting out to give us a full characterization of what a meaningful life would be. So it's not really fair to criticize an author, author for what they didn't do, right? I could say, well, Nagel didn't tell me about the, the meaning of love in this piece, so it wasn't very good. Well, that's not what he was trying to do in the first place, so that's, that's really not a just, justified criticism. That's like criticizing a, a, a recipe for you know, baking cookies for not being an exciting action movie. It never pretended to be in the first place, so it's, it's just a bizarre sort of criticism. Um, one, uh, really at the extreme of this, the second point, trying to escape the seriousness with which we take our lives, um, at, at the extreme of that would be to just completely abandon projects entirely and drift through our lives like animals, right? To, in some sense, cease being human and, and become more like a non-human animal or become fully like a non-human animal. Now, that possibility itself seems um, very remote, I think, for almost all of us, uh, if not impossible to achieve fully. That's another point I'll leave open. Uh, feel free to engage with it if you want. So Nagel thinks we can't really escape the absurd. Uh, we certainly can't do it consciously. We, we can do it to some extent, um, you know, by, by taking ourselves a little less seriously. but um, can we ultimately get out of it? Nagel doesn't think so, but does that mean this is really a problem, right? Is the fact that our lives are absurd or that we can always uh, see them in an absurd light by taking that backward step and, and looking at what we're doing and realizing we can't fully justify what we're doing, is that really a, a big problem? Right? Is that something we need a solution for? Well, Camus seems to, right? Um, Camus was looking at this, right, thinking about suicide as, um, you know, it seems like uh, given our absurd situation, we should kill ourselves. And ultimately, Camus rejects that and says, no, really what we should do is, is revolt. Uh, instead, we should stay in life and sort of rage against this caring, uncaring and indifferent universe. Um, Nagel just doesn't really see the, the, the reasons there. So on looking at what Camus says, uh, Nagel thinks he, he doesn't really have good grounds for rejecting those escapist solutions like suicide or, or faith in something, that leap of faith, right? Um, this revolt or scorn or defiance, these are different ways we can characterize it. So we saw Camus talking about revolt. Um, Nagel talks about scorn or defiance. As Nagel puts it, this is so, supposed to restore a certain kind of nobility to life. Um, gives it a kind of value, but it doesn't make it unabsurd. It doesn't get rid of the absurdity of the situation. It just provides it some kind of value, at least in Camus' eyes, um, which there's, there's a question there. Is Camus just giving us his own idiosyncratic um, sort of answer now, right? Well, we should revolt. Why? Because I like it. I think it gives life a certain aesthetic dimension that, that makes it valuable, um, which isn't to say it's meaningful or ultimately justified or anything like that. Maybe Camus just giving us his own um, personal take on things. Nagel instead 
holds that irony is the correct response to the absurd, right? Um, why? And so, you know, irony, what, what is irony really? Um, well, you know, look, if, if we're being ironic about something, generally that means we, we sort of mean the opposite of, of what we intend, right? So somebody's being ironic, um, right? There's, there's sort of this reverse of what's going on. What's Nagel really talking about here? Well, look, the way he's characterizing how the absurd arises for us is that we, we take our lives really seriously without any good reason to do so. Now, we're gonna go on doing that, Nagel says, right? You know, eventually we, we sort of stop philosophizing, we stop sort of gazing off at the universe and thinking, oh, what's the point of it all? And just get back to, you know, like I gotta go do groceries or dishes or have some food because I'm hungry, right? Yeah, but why should I stay alive and, and eat dinner? Look, I can I can ask those questions, and I can right. I'm trained to ask these sorts of questions, and I can ask them a lot. And eventually, I stop and go do other things, right, and, and live a human life like many other humans. Um, the irony dimension comes in through the recognition that we're doing these things that we're leading that kind of life, engaging in these sorts of projects without being able to fully justify it, right? Without being able to give a full account of why it is we're doing what we're doing. So um, just on Camus' response, Nagel says that um, to, to him, um, Camus' response seems romantic and slightly self-pitying. Our absurdity warrants neither that much distress nor that much defiance. At the risk of falling into romanticism by a different route, I would argue that absurdity is one of the most human things about us, a manifestation of our most advanced and interesting characteristics. Like skepticism and epistemology, it is possible only because we possess a certain kind of insight, the capacity to transcend ourselves in thought. So is the absurd really a problem? Nagel says, no, no, it's, it's really a product of some of our best qualities, right? If we, if we didn't have the intelligence we do, we wouldn't have the absurd, so we could, could get out of it, right? If we all just lobotomized ourselves or something. Um, but is it worth it, right? Should we do that? Is that much of a problem? No, not really. Instead, what we can do is, is recognize the absurd, recognize that all of our situations are absurd, and go on living our lives, but living them in that way that's sort of tinged by irony, that we, we recognize there's no ultimate justification for what we're doing. So we're all, in some sense, in the same, same situation, right? We're all going about our projects and our lives, making choices and, and decisions, even though we can't fully justify what we're doing, which in some sense could give us a, a kind of solidarity, right? We all, if we can all recognize we're in the same situation, uh, then maybe we you know, might be a little bit more forgiving of each other. So uh, I'll just close with um, what Nagel says right, right near the end of his piece. He says, if a sense of the absurd is a way of perceiving our true situation, then what reason can we have to resent or escape it? It need not be a matter for agony unless we make it so. Nor need it evoke the defiant contempt of fate that allows us to feel brave or proud. Such dramatics, even if carried on in private, betray a failure to appreciate the cosmic unimportance of the situation. If sub specie eternitatis, that means from the point of view of eternity, there's no reason to believe that anything matters, then that does not matter either. And we can approach our absurd lives with irony instead of heroism or despair. So that really takes me to the end of my remarks on Nagel. So instead of belaboring things, I'll just go ahead and stop here. So this is the last video lecture for this week. Next week, I'll be back with uh, another series, our last full series in the course. Um, I hope you've all had a good week. I hope you have an excellent weekend. And you'll see me on Monday when I'm back with well, whoever I'm talking about on the schedule, because I, I can't quite recall off the top of my head, I think it's Moritz, uh, Moritz Schlick, uh, but I'll, I'll check and I'll do whatever I said I was going to do. Have a great weekend. You'll see me next week. Until then, bye for now.